one new interior point for each interval. Okay, so that is a general idea. Again, let me show you uh, this picture. Suppose you want, you can see from case one. What happening is, let's say this is the optimum point that we are looking for, the location. This is the function at lower value, f sub l, corresponding to this location, x sub l, specified by the user. This is the user specified x upper bound from the beginning. Corresponding to that, the function value is f sub u. So right now, we have those two points, f l and f u. According to the golden section, we have to insert two more points, which is the interior point x1. Corresponding to that, the function will be f1. The interior point x2, corresponding to that, the function will be f2. So now, you just look carefully at those four points. The lower bound is here. The upper bound is here. F2 is here. And F1 is here. And let's see when will the pattern change. You can see from lower bound function value to upper bound uh, to the two point F2, the value go up. Then from F2 to the next point, which is F1, the value go down. The pattern change. Instead of up, it go down. The pattern change. When the pattern change like that, you say right away. This point should be the new upper bound and two points before that, which is the this point right here should be the the new lower bound. So based on that, for case one, we say the interval in the beginning is very big like this. In the next iteration, the interval is shorter because it will be between this new lower bow and this new upper bow. Keep in mind that the new lower bow is the same thing as the old lower bow, but the new upper bow is different from the old upper bow. So that is for case, case one. Now case two, the situation is s small, slightly different. Again, for case 2, the optimum we know is supposed to be around here. We want to see, okay, this is f lower bound. This is a function at upper bound. You insert point x1 according to the formula that we developed earlier. This is a function at f x1, I mean right here. And then corresponding to x2, the function is right there. And again, we look at the pattern. Let's see what happened, the pattern. To go from F lower bound to F2, as you can see, the function go up. To go from F2 to F1, again, the function increase. But to go from F1 to FU, the function go down, so the patterns change. When the patterns change, that means right there will be the new upper bound, and then you go back two more points before that, that point right there will be the new lower bound. And therefore, the next interval should be only this small. So you can see the difference between the two cases, case 1 and case 2, right? For case 1, F2 is bigger than F1. For case 2, F2 is smaller than F1. So, once you reduce the interval, again, you just insert two points, the new two points, x1 and x2. But luckily, out of those two points, one of them you already got it from the previous iteration. So, that's the way it works. Okay? So, depending on function at x2 is bigger than x1, then the new logo bar is still the same. But the new upper bound now become x1. On the other hand, if the function fx2 is less than fx1, then the new upper bound is the same like the previous iteration, but the new lower bound is different from the previous iteration. 
Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide. Let's go to the next slide. Golden section. All right. Uh, suppose we want to figure out the maximum of the function f of theta, max of theta, is this. Now, one thing you have to know, if you want to maximize a function f, maximize a function f, that is the same thing as minimizing a new function which is equal to the negative of the previous function. So in other words, sometimes you want to maximize a function, sometimes you want to minimize a function, but keep in mind that maximize a function f is the same thing as minimizing a function equal to negative f. That's one thing I want to mention. Now, the main thing about wooden section, the advantage, is you need to insert only one point inside the new interval, not two point interior. And then finally, there's the one more important remark. If you remember all, all my previous slides, I always say that the user supposed to provide the initial lower bound and upper bound. That could be inconvenient or sometimes it may not be easy to figure out the lower bound and the upper bound initially. So for that reason, I want to explain the golden section again from a different viewpoint which is a lot more precise and it also at the same time give you the initial x lower bound and upper bound. You don't have to worry about that. It will figure out by itself. Okay, the next slide. Now this slide will be a little bit complicated. So let me explain to you this way. Suppose you have the horizontal axis is alpha. It could be x, you know. Now I call it alpha. And then the vertical axis, I want to minimize the function g. And that function g, depending on alpha, if you plot it, you will see it will look like a red curve like this. By the way, suppose you don't feel comfortable with minimizing a function because you say you prefer to maximizing a function. Well, there's another way to do. If you take the negative of that f red function and you plot it, roughly speaking, it will look something like this. So, instead of minimizing the red function g here you may say i want to maximizing the new function which i call minus g as you can see that function for, for example at this location the function value is this much the red vertical distance that is the same thing as this distance that you want to maximize. So instead of minimizing the red distance, now you want to maximize the blue distance. So uh, even though my discussion here is related to minimization of a function, but the same idea could be applied for maximizing a function as well. Okay, let me erase this thing here so that the picture look a little bit clearer. And let me erase this thing here. Now, here's an important derivation. First, we notice, suppose the user select a small value delta. You see? A small value delta right there. That is the only number, a small number that can be provided by the user. For example, delta is like 0 0.01 or 0 0.05, just some small number. Now, once you select that value delta, then I hope you can see the distance from here to there, we call it delta. Then, the next interval that we select, I show you here in the red color right there. That ne the next interval distance should be equal to 1.618 times the previous interval, which is delta. 
Now remember, you may say, where's that number 1.618 come from? Remember, in the earlier derivation, we have something to do with 0 0.618. That's the reason why we get this number 1.618. Okay, so the first distance is delta. The next interval distance will be 1.618 times the previous guy. That's why you get 1.618 delta. How about the next distance? Well, the next distance you can see is this green color right there equal to the previous distance, which is 1.618 delta times 1.618 again. And that will give you the green distance interval right here, 1.618 squared times delta. And you can see the parent like that. The next distance always equal to the previous distance times 1.618. Okay, with that introduction, oh, by the way, I forgot to say one thing. S because the first interval is delta, as you can see right here. That's why the coordinate of this point is delta. And then because the second interval is 1.618 delta, so when you add up the first two guys together, you get this coordinate is 2.618 delta. And then when you add, at another interval 1.618 squared delta that will give you to the new coordinate look right here which is 5.232 delta and so on and so on so for example the next interval right here will be equal to the previous interval time 1.618 and if you take that interval you just calculate you add with this 5.232 delta then you will get the location of this point, which is 9.468 delta. Okay, so, so far I already explained to you how to figure out those interval distance. Now, the next thing I want to do is this. You start with the value of alpha equal to delta right there. Based on that, you can figure out the function value, which is this point right there on the curve. Then, you move to the next distance, which is at the coordinate alpha equal to 2.618 delta. Corresponding to that value, you figure out the function value right there. And then you observe, you see what happened. To go from point A to point B, the function value go down. And then you go to the next interval at the location 5.232 delta. The function value corresponding to that is right here, which I call point C. And then you observe the pattern still the same. The value from B to C still go down. Just like from A to B, from A to B is go down. So as long as the pattern does not change, you keep doing that. So the next point will be location 9.468 delta. Corresponding to that, the function value is here, which is point D. Again, the function value from C to D is still going down. So the pattern not change. So you take the next location, which is this point, and keep in mind this point is located in this interval, and that interval should be equal to the previous interval time 1.618, like I keep telling you. So, corresponding to this new location, the function value is right there. Let's call it point E. Now you see the pattern is changed because the function instead of go down, now the function going up from D to E. And just like what I told you before, whenever the pattern is changed, Right there, it's telling you that this point E should be the upper bound. And two point before that, which is, you go back to point C, two point before point E, that guy should be the lower bound. Okay? So now, in the beginning, just the user have to specify only the value of delta. This scheme automatically gives you the lower bound is at point C 
and the upper bound is at point E. It will figure out for you. By the way, the value